So this is our, our 19, 19th T symposium, and um, I'm, I've had the honor of being a speaker at all of our sym symposiums. And I'd like to thank Azad in particular for or organizing this virtual symposium today. And the plan here is to make it very practical and interactive, and we're going to use uh, virtual cases, and we were each assigned cases and topics uh, for which we'll cover material for. And I was assigned aortic insufficiency, and uh, I think it's important to look just at this initial slide and look at the graphic of the aortic valve. One is a pictorial uh, demonstration of how the aortic valve moves uh, during the cardiac cycle. And the other one, which is the, um, the blue image there, is actually a model that was reconstructed from T data. And you can see again that the uh, aortic valve and the aortic complex is not a static structure. It's actually uh, a structure that moves during the cardiac cycle. I have no competing interests. So the first case I'm going to present is that of an 80-year-old female. She's asymptomatic. She has comorbidities of hypertension. On transthoracic echo, she had the incidental finding of an aortic aneurysm and some aortic insufficiency. Her CT scan confirmed the presence of an aortic aneurysm of the ascending aorta and proximal arch, and she appears in our operating room. And the first image you get is a four chamber view. And my apologies if the image quality is suboptimal, but uh, we have to sort of modify our clips a little bit for this type of virtual presentation. And while I've labeled this a four chamber view, you can see that the fourth chamber here is not your traditional fourth chamber. It's not actually the right atrium, but it's in fact the aortic root here. And this should clue you into maybe there might be a little bit of a problem with the aortic root. You can see the left ventricle is not particularly large, neither is the left atrium or the right ventricle, and the ventricular function seems to be reasonable. In this metasophageal long axis view, you can see again that the ventricle seems to be functioning well. The aortic root seems to be a little bit large, and uh, the left atrium and right ventricle seems, seem to be equally functioning well. So this is a transgastric view, and I've chosen these first three views just to give you an overview of the heart and the cardiac function. And you can see here, this is a uh, X-plane view or biplane view in the transgastric mid-short axis view, showing you the mid-papillary view as well as a long axis view or two-chamber view. Uh, and you can see that, again, the heart's not exceptionally large. Uh, the global function seems to be intact without any regional wall motion abnormalities. Now here's the money image, and you can see quite uh, obviously that there are at least one abnormality present. And <clears throat> you can probably spot a second abnormality. Just look at this image. It's a mid-esophageal aortic valve, long axis view. We've eliminated most of the left ventricle. We've actually decreased the angle a little bit uh, to 118 degrees, and you can see that there are at least two abnormalities present here. And I'm sure you've spotted the first abnormality, not a problem. You can see here the ascending aorta appears dilated. The second abnormality is this abnormality with the single arrow, and that actually is a displaced coronary artery. And this happens to be the left coronary artery. Normally, you wouldn't necessarily see it in this particular view, uh, but in this patient, you do. So identifying coronary anatomy can be important when you're assessing aortic insufficiency. When we turn color on here, we can see that not only is the aortic root dilated, but the aortic valve is dysfunctional as well. There seems to be some uh, AI. And the question that's often asked in this view is, well, how much AI is there? And I'm sure everybody's done a guesstimate and say, oh, well, it's probably maybe moderate. Uh, it could be severe. We're probably going to have to do a little bit of better assessment and look at some other parameters to determine how much AI there might be. And we look in the short axis view here. This is the mid-esophageal aortic valve short axis view with a color compare. And we can see that the aortic root seems, or the aortic valve and root, seem to be really of relatively normal size here. We can see three cusps of the aortic valve. They seem to open well. 
we can see that, however, when they close, there's malcoaptation in the middle or central malcoaptation. And not surprisingly, this is where the JETF AI originates from. So we have a patient with central AI here. So when we put the money shots together, we see we've got a dilated aortic root. We have aortic insufficiency that appears to be central and relates to central cusp malcoaptation. And we've identified three cusps, a normal three cusp aortic valve. So question number one, and remember these questions will come up in the MCQ session later on today. You may find the answer as we go through the talk, but they're important questions just in terms of improving perhaps your uh, assessment uh, as, you, as you perform interoperative transsophial echo. So the question is, which component of the aortic root is measured in systole? Is it the annulus, sinus of Valsalva, the sinotubular junction, or the ascending aorta? So what's an accurate aortic root measurement and what will it entail? Well, you've got to decide whether you're going to measure the root in systole or diastole. That's the first thing. Then you've got to look and make sure that you're aligned perpendicular, preferably to the walls of the uh, root and the aorta. And finally, you've got to understand what the standards might be. There are some sex, age, and body surface area um, uh, measurements that actually are related to normals. So this is the table from Lang's paper. This is the quantitative paper from 2015. And you can see here what the absolute values are. They do differ slightly men to women and they do differ uh, according to age and body surface area. There are nomograms and you can see as you age your, uh, your root in particular, these, this is a sinus of Valsalva. Uh, there's a larger range over which normal occurs. So it's important when you uh, assess aortic insufficiency to look for the mechanism of aortic insufficiency. And here you can see the root picture I showed you before. It's more important though, to look at the actual root itself and to determine how well the cusps coapt together. Uh, and here you can see normal coaptation. And it's important to have in your mind what normal is because recognizing abnormal assumes you know what normal is. So other than the, the sort of displaced coronary that you see there, this would be relatively normal coaptation. And when we do our measurements here, we find these measurements. So we find in an 80 year old female, the annulus measures 2.2, the sinus is 2.9, the sinotubular junction at 3.3, and the ascending aorta, not surprisingly, is quite large at 6.09. So the pathology relates to both the sinotubular junction as well as the ascending aorta. And that is in fact why this patient has AI. If the sinotubular junction was spared, it's very common for these patients not to have any AI at all and just have aortic root or ascending aorta dilatation. So when we think about aortic insufficiency, we classify it commonly now using something called the Alcori, the Alcori classification. And this looks at the structural abnormality that might be present uh, causing aortic insufficiency. And it's based similar to the Carpentier classification into type one, two, and three. Type one relates to normal cusp motion, type two to cusp prolapse, and type three to cusp restriction. And you can see in this patient, the patient would have had a type one A. And this uh, pictorial is a little bit um, problematic, I found. I prefer this actual image here, which suggests that the problem exists from the STJ and above. So the sinotubular junction and the ascending aorta with sparing of the root, but there is still AI present. It's important to remember that etiology and mechanism are two different concepts. Etiology is the cause of the problem. Mechanism is the structural abnormality that is present. So you can have cusp problems such as prolapse by cuspid perforation, endocarditis, calcific or rheumatic disease, you can have an aortic aneurysm. And, you know, we think of aortic aneurysms as just being common, uh, sort of all as a result of a single cause, but it is, they aren't. We see a lot of patients with genetic problems. We see congenital problems. 
uh, systemic con connective tissue disease. Clearly the most common that we see are related to hypertension and uh, age. And you can have loss of control support. So trauma and dissection can cause AI as well. When we grade chronic aortic insufficiency, we use multiple parameters. And this is a rather complex table that was that's in Zogabi's uh, JACE paper for assessment of native valve regurgitation from 2017. And really there's multiple parameters that are used. There are qualitative parameters, semi-quantitative and quantitative parameters. And sometimes it's very challenging to remember all the details in this table. It's probably better to remember what severe is and understand if you remember numbers like six, so greater than six um, for the width, greater than 65% for the jet uh, LVOT to um, uh, LVOT width uh, ratio, all of these will, will help you understand what's severe. But there are many limitations to AI assessment. So there's some technical limitations related to what you use as a Nyquist limit. There's spectral limitations for alignment. Uh, if you have different jet types, such as eccentric or multiple, then it can be quite time consuming. There's also hemodynamic variables that go into this, whether there's a significant pressure difference or low difference, the duration, whether it's pan-systolic or pan-diastolic as it happens to be in AI, and whether it's an acute or chronic problem. And in fact, you end up with this very complex diagram here from Zogabi, which sort of helps you try to understand what's mild, moderate, and severe. And I don't think anybody has the capacity to remember this um, off the top of their head without having to look it up. So when we grade AI severity, as we would do in this case, it's, we look at things like vena contracta width and jet height to LVOT ratio. And if we do the math, this is what we get. And again, I, I emphasize it's really important to know the technical nuances that go on when you're assessing these jets. And here what I've done is zoomed and superimposed what should be the actual jet that you should see. And you can see there are three components to this jet. There's the real proximal component, which is the flow acceleration. There's a narrow component, the vena contracta, and finally the jet area. And where you measure and when you measure can be quite variable. So it's important to spend a little bit of time to zoom in, make sure you have a very nice jet that has all three components before you start measuring and quantifying AI severity. You can do pressure half time, and this is done in the stomach through a transgastric view, either a deep transgastric or a long axis view, and you can see a pressure half time of 405, some aortic uh, flow reversal, and this patient did not have significant aorta reversal. So when you put it all together, the vena contractive width is seven millimeters, which would suggest the patient has severe. When you compare all the other ones, again, you have what's fairly common, which are parameters that support either moderate or severe. Um, so whether you classify this as moderate or severe really depends on other parameters that you can use. One thing you can do that's fairly simple is to do um, a and EROA or PISA based on a PISA calculation, and you do this in the deep transgastric view. Everybody gets a, um, a jet of AI, and you just change your baseline and move it upwards so that you make the hemisphere at the bottom where the flow acceleration is as large as you can. You can measure this, and the radius in this patient happens to be 0.6. And if you've done pressure half time, you already have the AI jet and the, a recording of the CW of the AI jet. And all you do is trace that AI jet around and there's software within your machine, if you know how to activate it, that will automatically do these calculations for you. So in this patient, when you look at the quantification methods that we use, the patient had an EROA of 0.18 and a regurgitant volume of 46 cc's, which probably went with your um, initial gut feeling when I showed you the aortic valve long axis view with color. And both of these measures suggest the patient has moderate AI. It gets very complicated. Um, can we simplify it? And this is an attempt from the American Society of Echocardiography to create guidelines that uh, help us uh, in, in assessing patients in the operating room. And this is what they suggest for AI pre-assessment. So evaluate the aortic valve anatomy, identify the coronary osteo, which we did, 
look at um, aortic valve function uh, in terms of assessment of severity and look at global function and regional function of the LV, all of which we've done. And there's post parameters that you can look at as well. I would highly recommend this paper as a, as a good read for people who are just starting out in echocardiography. So what's the surgeon going to do? So here we have an ascending aortic aneurysm with AI, um, and this is what the surgeon would be looking at. Question is, does he need to replace the valve and the aorta, just replace the aorta, do a valve sparing procedure, or just do an aortic valve replacement, i.e. fix what's wrong, which is um, the leaky valve, and not do anything to the ascending aorta. Well, not surprisingly, the surgeon chooses to just replace the ascending aorta here. He would open inspect the valve, put in a Dacron graft, uh, and be done. And this is what was done in this case. And you can see here, I've marked with the yellow arrows where the Dacron graft is. And the patient actually in long axis initially had what looked like a good result. Uh, when we looked at it in short axis, however, we recognized the patient still had some AI. But remember, the surgeon, uh, the reason the patient was in the operating room was because of that six a uh, centimeter dilated ascending aorta, which is no longer there. And this is an acceptable amount of AI that the patient can, can no doubt live with. So case number two, this is a younger patient, a 62 year old male, also asymptomatic, a few more comorbidities. This is a, a patient with hypertension, um, OSA, uh, a current smoker, diabetes, had a history of SVT as well. Uh, on TTE was found to have a dilated aorta and AI, but had a, a, the start of a dilated ventricle. So the left ventricular internal diameter was 63 millimeters and on angiogram had a 50% LAD. And again, when we look at the uh, four chamber view, we don't really get a four chamber view. The fourth chamber here again is the aortic root. You can see the LV is a little bit more dilated than the other patient with a uh, preserved ventricular function. And again, this is confirmed in the long axis view. You can see the LV is maybe a little bit dilated. The root is quite prominent. Uh, the right ventricle seems small and well-functioning, as does the um, left atrium. LV, again, uh, maybe we're not quite perpendicular, but this is the transgastic mid short axis view and two chamber view. You can see that the heart seems to be functioning well. And again, we go to the money shot here, which is the aortic valve long axis view. And you can see how different this route is compared to the previous route. The architecture and structures is distorted. There's now dilatation of the route itself. You don't see a very specific sinotubular junction. And when you look at the coaptation of those leaflets, you can see they barely coapt. So again, very abnormal structure here. Not surprisingly, when we turn color on, we see leakage of the valve. And again, there's a central jet of AI here. This is a more zoomed in picture and we're seeing uh, sort of just a bit of the aortic valve here, the LVOT, and you can see there's central AI here. And when we look at the short axis view, we see again, the root is dilated. So you can notice how large that aortic um, uh, valve looks. Again, there's three cusps, they seem to open well, but unfortunately there's malcoaptation in the center. So again, you have this central jet of AI. So again, when we look at this, we have a dilated root now. We uh, haven't yet assessed the ascending aorta, but we do see central AI from central malcoaptation. So a similar problem to the first patient, except now we've got the aortic root involved. And when we look at the mechanisms here, we see the measurements are done. The annulus is preserved, it's 2.4. The sinuses are large at 52 uh, millimeters or 5.2 centimeters. Sinotubular junction, which is a bit of a guess here, is five centimeters. And to actually get a good measurement of the ascending aorta, we pull the probe back, reduced our angle by 20 degrees so that we're seeing the right pulmonary artery in the circular structure. And then we're measuring the ascending aorta, which is also dilated at 4.2. So when we think about the mechanism in this patient, this patient has AI based on the type 1B. So not only do we have dilation of the ascending aorta and STJ, but we now have dilation of the root as well. 
The annulus, however, is preserved. So we see something like this, where this is just a cartoon representation of what the mechanism would be. So just to review, type one, we have mostly ascending aorta. Type two, we have root. Type three, which we'll come to, or type 31B, 1C is uh, annular dilatation and then cusp perforation. So these are all pathologies related, or the mechanisms related to type one. So when we look at AI severity, again, we measure the vena contracta, which is 3.2 millimeters here, um, and the ratio is 28%. The pressure half time is not as significant, it's 561. And there appears to be a bit of aortic flow reversal. So these indicate mild to moderate AI. Um, we can do PISA again, which we try and do here. I find that when I'm doing PISA, uh, the less the AI, the more error you tend to introduce because it's very hard to get a good uh, PISA radius sometimes, even if you shift the baseline. But here we're able to see that um, the quantitative measures also confer mild to moderate um, AI here. So the ERO, EROA was 0.13 and the regurgitant of volume is only 24 cc's. So the question is, what does a surgeon do with this type of patient? And I would highly recommend this paper. It's a recent paper from 2019 uh, that looks at what aortic valve repair measurements an echocardiographer needs to take prior to uh, a surgeon debating whether to do any sort of valve sparing procedure. And I know that my colleagues will be discussing this in detail a little bit further on, but these are just some of the measurements that you would be looking at. So you would do an annular measurement and uh, dilation would be considered greater than 25. You can look at the geometric height, which is the, um, the length of the leaflets themselves, which greater than 16 millimeters is considered abnormal. The coaptation length or coaptation height, which is the length of coaptation. And again, five millimeters is considered abnormal and this patient obviously had less than five millimeters. And you would look at the effective height, which is the distance between the annulus and um, the dis distal portion of, of coaptation. And anything uh, less than nine millimeters is a problem. So what's the surgeon going to do with this particular patient? And again, the options are very much the same as the first patient, younger patient, however, uh, and recognizing the center you're at, the choices are dental with an aortic valve replacement and replacement of the aorta, replacement just of the aorta, uh, valve sparing root or aortic valve replacement. And I would have to say when in our house, we do an a, a valve sparing procedure, so the patient underwent um, a reimplantation procedure. Here you can see the um, cusp would be inspected. Uh, the diseased aorta is taken away. The pillars of these um, commissures are then sewn into this Dacron graft here. And you can see them sort of, the geometry is trying to be preserved here. The surgeon's suturing in the um, pillars. He instills a bit of saline, and this is what they often call the poor man's echo. Uh, if it doesn't leak, they figure it's going to be good. They put in the coronary buttons and finally do the, um, the rest of the aorta, and they finish the procedure. And post-pump, you get pictures that look like this. They're not aesthetically pleasing, and you're asked to comment about whether this is a satisfactory um, uh, result or not. And again, I think my colleagues will, will look at this in a little bit more detail in some of the upcoming sessions. Uh, but you can see functionally here, there doesn't appear to be any AI, um, and uh, the result seems to be acceptable. And here it is in short axis. So question number two. This normal spectral Doppler trace is imaged from which segment of the aorta? So this is a, a PW that uh, the sample volume was positioned in a particular part of the aorta and giving this very normal trace. And um, this is something that, you know, you should probably be able to tease out. It does take a little bit of cerebral uh, effort, but essentially, I think you probably can come up with an answer. 
So I was asked to talk about aortic flow reversal in the assessment of AI, and uh, it does appear in the guidelines, and these are the 2017 guidelines. Um, the assessment reflects uh, both transthoracic and transesophageal uh, options. For transthoracic, um, the sample volume is actually placed in the proximal um, descending aorta. So this is done through a supersternal um, notch uh, view. And you can see here the abnormality is shown above the baseline. So this is flow that goes towards the baseline, uh, towards the probe. And it's uh, an opportunity for us to, to have some sort of qualitative um, verification of aortic insufficiency. So the pathology here is if you have prominent hollow diastolic reversal, that's significant for severe uh, AI. And you can read this uh, little paragraph in the guidelines. What about transesophageal? Well, in transesophageal, it's very important to know what normal flow is, again, before you know what abnormal flow is. So when you look at it in the arch, these are all normal flows in the arch. And when you look at it in short axis in the descending aorta, this is what you would see. And finally, if you look at it in the descending aorta and long axis, this is what you would see. So what is abnormal? So aortic flow reversal is flow that, uh, depending on where you're sampling, um, is hollow diastolic reversal. So this is flow that happens to be here in the arch. Um, this can be quite normal in the arch. As you go, go more distally to the descending aorta, it becomes pathological. So if you have flow reversal in the descending aorta, it indicates either moderate to severe AI. And this has been long known. This is a 1994 classic paper by Sutton, which looked at all of this and was able to show that flow reversal was pathological. So you need to look at it in the descending aorta more so than the arch. How much? So these are all patients that have descending flow reversal. It has to be hollow diastolic and they all have hollow diastolic. If it's in the abdominal aorta, it's considered severe. You can look at the ratio of forward flow to reverse flow, and this can approximate the regurgitant volume. And this again is from Zogaby's paper. It's important, however, to remember that there is a differential here, that there's other causes. And the elderly patient in particular with a reduced compliance in the aorta may have normally some flow reversal. So just because you see flow reversal in the aorta, don't assume the patient has AI. So cases one and two to wrap up key points, ascending aorta pathology may or may not have AI. I chose two examples that did have AI, but it doesn't necessarily have to have AI. It's important to identify the mechanism. So if you can look at whether it's type one, two, or three, and then the etiology of the AI. You can determine severity quite easily. And if you see descending aorta holodiastolic flow, it's a qualitative support for severe AI. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vegas, for an absolutely um, wonderful talk just to get this uh, meeting going. And, you know, I think everything else is going to pale in comparison to, to, to that show of mastery. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I think we have a little bit of time. If anyone wants to post a question or... You can either type it or we can unmute you. I think Azad, is that okay? We can uh, ask people to to type them in below. Okay, so Andre Deneau is uh, is here. Uh, he's asking, can you clarify cause versus mechanism? Yeah, sure. Hey, Andre, uh, welcome. I hope I hope you're well. Um, yeah, sure. It's it's a bit like Carpante. You know, what you're trying to do is look for the structural abnormality there. So what's wrong with the complex? Um, so the aortic valve, it's not just the aortic valve, it's the aortic valve complex. So is there a problem with uh, the aortic valve itself? Is there a problem with the root? Is there a problem with the aorta? Much like you would do for the mitral valve. Etiology reflects what is really the underlying cause of this. Is it a problem with endocarditis? Is it a problem with um, uh, some connective tissue disorder? Whatever the root cause is. So I, I would say mechanism is kind of that global 
uh, umbrella. So you choose one of the, the three types. And then etiology is drilling down to see what, what the actual cause of, of the problem is. Um, not sure if I see any other questions. There's a question in the chat, hang on. Uh, I can read it out, Bilal, no, no problem. It says, what about you people? When uh, they have elastic aorta, can we expect some early diastolic flow reversal? Absolutely. So it's important to distinguish early diastolic flow reversal from hollow diastolic flow reversal. So the majority of patients will have some degree of early diastolic. Remember, the, um, the aorta recoils, number one. Number two, closure of the aortic valve depends on some backwards flow. Um, not that you're going to see a lot of it, but you will see it perhaps in the arch. Um, and it's it's not uncommon to see uh, early diastolic flow reversal as being a normal in, in every patient, actually. 